Photography Daily. If you get to die doing something that you love and enjoying every last moment, well, I can't I can't think of anything better, to be honest. I'd like for you to meet the most extraordinary photographic storyteller, Jason P. Howe, who taught himself how to photograph in conflict and civil war zones. And uh, although I loved working in the camera shop and was fascinated by camera gear and all that kind of thing, I would look over at the, the manager of the camera shop and think that is not where I want to be in the future. Leaving the relative safety of a shop floor next stop, Colombia. Latin America was a place that I'd spent a lot of time. I'd made multiple trips over the previous decade. So I felt that I actually could find something to say about that conflict. But it didn't take long before Jason met his initial challenge. By the next early morning, I'd been hauled off a bus by a group of soldiers and they had got my kit out and they'd found my body armour. They had found my medical kit. Kit. Some home truths today, quite literally, in terms of the rules of engagement when photographing a conflict. One lie to the wrong person and you get caught out and that's the end of you. We follow Jason across Colombia as he attempts to cover the story from all angles. The paramilitaries do not invite the press around to document the things that they're doing. And so this was a whole side of the conflict that certainly could not be ignored but the stakes were were much higher. This is a rare and real insight into what covering a story like this as a personal project initially involves. All of this project was done on a very tiny budget. I, in fact, had a job stacking shelves at Tesco's in between trips to Colombia, putting cans of beans and bottles of Coke on, on the shelves. The story turns with a chance meeting. On one particular bus journey, I met a young woman and we ended up on a bus sharing uh, a couple of seats and got into conversation and I explained what I was doing, that I was working on this project about the conflict and that I had been photographed from the FARC and now I was off to photograph the paramilitary. And Marilyn, the young woman Jason talks of, reveals a secret. I have to say, it didn't come as the huge shock that most normal people in normal situations would think that it would. This is part one of a two-parter today, featuring Jason's incredibly potent work in Colombia and his feelings about being a photojournalist in a war zone. Trying to, to show respect for the people whose lives we're documenting. They have no choice. They are stuck there. Stories of life told by photographers. And today, that photographer is Jason P. Howe. Making this podcast has been, for me at any rate, an education, photographically and mentally. I get to talk to photographers I would never have had the privilege to meet otherwise, and I realise what a special opportunity that is. And I hope that uh, it has value for you too, as somebody interested in how other people make pictures in all their various guises and genres. This today is not simply a, a let's talk about being a war photographer episode. I think it demonstrates vividly the, the risks some people are prepared to take and make to tell the story for those who aren't able to do so themselves for a multitude of reasons, to present a picture to an outside world that they otherwise might not see. And in part two, Jason's story takes us on a road that undulates at times unsteadily towards where he finds himself today. More about that, though, on a bonus Monday edition to come next week. This show is about those who make the pictures, their different journeys, and often very personal accounts, the why rather than the how of being a photographer. And it's supported by our wonderful patrons and mpb.com. And you'll forgive me uh, for giving them a mention right at the head of today's programme. Patron of the day today is Jens Roder. I like that he refers on his website to his work as photographic sketches. Don't expect, as he says, for this to be a portfolio. There'll be all kinds of photographs. Some more planned and edited from my walkabouts with a camera, he says. Small improvised setups from my desk with model figures. Not all Zoom meetings are equally engaging. Other days it could be a new piece of pottery my wife has made. Or some interesting light on the wall. In short, no firm plans. It is, I think, an observational invite into his life. And I like that kind of work a lot. I'll link to his website today on the show page. You'll find all the links there and some photographs from today's episode. Joining Patreon is easy and from the price of one high street coffee per month, patrons are so important to helping maintain a future with this cast. I know I say that every week, but I mean it. To thank them, or you if you're a patron, 
All patrons get to hear the the extra more editions, which on Thursdays include my photographic diary essay and also the new book club, which you can hear on the very easy to download Patreon app. We're also supported by MPB.com, who help you buy and sell and trade used camera gear in the US, the UK and Europe. And here's two reasons why you can trust them for your picture making. One, peace of mind when you're buying in the form of a guarantee. And two, money in your bank quickly if you choose to sell through them. So if you want to buy or sell or trade used gear and be a part of this ever important circular economy mpb.com is a great place to do business and i use them myself so jason p howe i have a book here it's called columbia between the lines dedicated to the people of the country and their search for peace a very brief history government repression in the 40s and 50s gives rise to a bloody period known as la violencia those who flee to start new lives elsewhere in the country are both bombed from the air and attacked by troops, which gives rise to the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, F-A-R-C, who fight the oppression. The FARC are not the only armed group to fight. There's a National Liberation Army, further rebel groups, and military-formed right-wing paramilitary groups. This civil war, its tentacles of violence, human tragedy and complex battles for power whilst opposing beliefs and factions try to embrace or promote a chance for peace is something I I can't easily unpick or explain fully in a few short paragraphs. It is a history programme of its own, and I recommend you read the book Jason has presented to the world. The journalist Jason Burke wrote in his foreword to the book, Jason did not study photography or journalism. He considered, he told me once, signing up for a course, but decided in the end it would be better to just go and get stuck in and learn as he went along. He set off for Colombia with a Leica and 50 rolls of film. Within a few months, he'd lived in a FARC rebel camp, been in his first firefight, narrowly missed getting blown to bits by a booby trap bomb that killed several of the soldiers he was with, and met coca farmers, drug dealers, paramilitaries, and the girl who he later became romantically involved with, who turned out to be a, well you'll have to wait for the story. And that's where we pick up. Humble beginnings, perhaps, for a photographer who is known now and recognised for his approach in a much misunderstood genre. Jason, you you didn't study photography, though you did work in a camera shop for the best part of a decade. I I learned from the foreword in this this book, Columbia Between the Lines, that, uh, in fact, you packed up a Leica rangefinder, 50 rolls of film, took yourself to Columbia to become a photographer. Um, was that literally it? I mean, it's, it sounds. I, I don't want to. Use, I'm going to use the word romantic with a small r because, of course, what what you were doing and what you were photographing was anything but. But but it does sound a bit like that. Uh, yes, I would say it was absolutely uh, a romantic uh, adventure. Basically, when I worked in that camera shop, I met my first travel photographer, someone who made a living full time from travelling around the world, making educational images and images for the for the travel market. And I met my first war photographer. Mm who would come in with his camera all battered and dented just back from Afghanistan or wherever. And uh, although I loved working in the camera shop and was fascinated by camera gear and all that kind of thing, I would look over at the, the manager of the camera shop and think that is not where I want to be in the future. And I would look at these either of these two characters and say that is a lifestyle that I would like to have. But of course, you had, you had no no idea of what you were setting foot in, did you? I mean, you had to sell stuff to get out there. And from that moment on, you were fending for yourself. There was no agency, no newspaper, no affiliation, was there, when you went? No, not when I went out to Colombia. Uh, I had been travelling and taking pictures for quite a number of years prior to that. And in fact, had become uh, a little, well, we could say, bored with travel photography because it was at the time when more and more people were travelling, digital cameras had just come along. And so it was, you know, get one, buy one picture of Machu Picchu, get three free. Uh, The world was becoming saturated with images of people in exotic uh, locations. And that helped me to sort of decide that I wanted to do something that, from my own perspective, had more value and longer term Mm. so with travel photography it's it's something that again there's more and more of it coming out all the time but documenting a conflict those conflicts uh happen over a a defined period of time whether it's you know anything from a few weeks to a few years conflict in Colombia, of course went on for 50 years but 
I was inspired by the the images that I'd seen of the war in El Salvador and in Nicaragua and places like that. And also, you know, really struck by the fact that there was quite a limited amount of photography around, and certainly in terms of book form, just a handful of books on each of those conflicts. And I had thought about going to cover the war in the Balkans, but that was quite an intense conflict. And I knew that I didn't have the necessary skills and experience to not only survive it, but to actually produce meaningful imagery that would be of value. And so Latin America was a place that I'd spent a lot of time. I'd I'd made multiple trips over the previous decade. So I felt comfortable and I felt that I actually could find something to say about that conflict. But it was largely a search for adventure in the initial stages. It's, it's interesting that you, you talk about intensity and the intensity in the Balkans was strong. I mean, I know I know there's no league table of, of, of intensity, but when you look at what was going on in Colombia, um, this was not an easy place for many people to live and thrive, was it? No. I, I mean, one of the main things with all conflicts is that as a, a photographer going in, you are that's your choice. Yeah. You're choosing to go there and generally you can choose when to leave. And this is the, one of the big things that differentiates you from the locals who have no choice. They're, they're often trapped there. But the difference between, for example, the conflict in Colombia and, and many others is that it was low intensity. So it was small skirmishes in the jungles or in the mountains. It's guerrilla warfare. Yeah. So it's sort of hit and run tactics, uh, nothing like the conflicts that I went on to witness and photograph later on. Well, let's start with Colombia, because uh, I've read your book. You spent time with, um, we spent a lot of time with uh, with, with the FARC, um, uh, do I do I term them as rebels? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, can, can you, well, let's unpick the paramilitaries that exist on the ground, discounting, I suppose, the drugs cartels, but just so we get an idea of who, who there is and why or how you chose to spend time with each of those, because you couldn't just spend time with one group, of course. Well, not with a clear conscience, and they no. present the work as being, uh, you know, documentary yeah, work. Yeah. I, I initially read an article in The Guardian uh, about an area that had been given to the FARC to use really as an area to hold uh, peace negotiations. And it was called the Laboratory uh, for Peace. And it was demilitarised that bit, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And the Guardian's spin um, on the FARC has always kind of been that they are freedom fighters and they're fighting for for the poor. Yeah. And initially, that was really the only information that I had to go on. And inspired by the fact that their writer and their photographer had got in and spent some time with the FARC, yeah. I thought I would give it a go. So I managed to get an introduction uh, remotely. Someone actually phoned them. Back then they had a press office and so you could call and say that some journalists want to come down. They were, they were welcoming the media. Um, that's something that sort of went up and down depending on the political situation, depending on how well the negotiations were going and so on. So I got permission to go down there. Um, I did not have uh, a press pass. And about three days before I was due to set off, there were some IRA people picked up who had been training the FARC. And there was something going on where it was a sort of a drugs for training kind Mm. of setup. And they were teaching the FARC how to make or improve on these homemade mortars which they made using gas cylinders, which oh, small uh, gas cylinders dropped into the tube. Right, yeah, one. Yeah. Very inaccurate, caused huge, huge amount of damage. Yeah. But so these, these IRA guys had been picked up and one of them was on the run. Mm. And so the government said, right, we're closing down that zone again. So I decided that maybe if I set off that night and travelled overnight, I might be able to get through the checkpoints before everyone was aware of that. Pretty pretty kind of naive thought. And by the next early morning, I'd been hauled off a bus by uh, a group of soldiers and they had got all my kit out and they'd found my body armour. They had found my medical kit uh, and they'd actually found some... This was, this was in 2001 and they'd actually found some pictures that I'd taken in a fart camp a year or so previously, before I decided to start on this project. I'd just been down and been on a visit and made some images. So, of course, they were going through these pictures and they were fairly convinced that I was up to no good. So they made a call, a pickup truck arrived, a couple of guys in shades, long shirts with pistols and radios, no ID, uh, put me in the vehicle and drove away. My Spanish was very basic. I couldn't ascertain who they were. I thought they were perhaps 
paramilitaries. And um, the news reports during that year had said that there'd been you know, literally hundreds of extrajudicial killings yeah. by paramilitaries. So things didn't weren't didn't sort of look. It wasn't a great start, but um, it turned out that they were DAS. They were secret police, and they took me to the secret police headquarters. They ran an Interpol check on me, and obviously nothing. I don't say obviously, but nothing came up. <laughs> and um, they went through all my paperwork and everything, and they said, "Okay, you can go down there, but first you need to go back to Bogota. You need to get the press credentials." and then you can go. So that delayed me by a month before I even managed to get back in, in face-to-face with FARC again. Yeah. By the time I got back down there, the peace negotiations were not going very well and they were not being very media-friendly. So they said, there's, there's no access for you at the moment. Go and get yourself a hotel in the village, in the nearby town rather, and if the situation changes, we'll let you know. So I had to explain to them that I had given up a full-time job. I would sold what possessions I had to get a camera, get some film, get an airfare and get out there. And this this was it. This was for me. You know, so I was all in on this. So they pointed to some tents that had been used by the peace delegation in a field and said, well, set yourself up in there. Let's see what happens. And a few weeks went by with no access to the camp, no possibility of taking any pictures. And there were actually two other photographers there. And after three weeks, they both gave up and left. And the very next day, I was invited out on a, on a small patrol to a checkpoint and I had to make some images. And the next day, I was told to move my stuff into the camp. And and then I spent on and off about six months documenting life with the with the rebels. So I, th- I think I saw, maybe, maybe it was in the film or maybe I read it in the book, that it was at that point that you that they sort of accepted you in ra- rather than saw you as an outsider. Yeah, I will also probably just realise that they were not going to get rid of me. Uh, <laughs> so they might as well, you know, might as well let me in and yeah. Um, you know, yeah. see if we can both benefit from this in some way. So, uh, I mean, your, your, your book reads like a journal in, in many respects. Um, and there's one entry here that I want to read. 7th December. So it's near the start, actually. Tomorrow I'm moving to a small village called El Tigre. It's supposedly a paramilitary stronghold. I want to see if the death squads are hard at work in these towns. First stop, the cemetery. Well, it, sound, it sounds almost flippant, though I know it's not. What kind of mind space do you, do you have to be in, essentially, to get more involved in this story and take more chances? Well, I think that I, what I was feeling is that the images that I was making in the far camp were images that basically anybody could make if yeah. they'd got themselves that far. You know, they, they didn't feel like let's say unique moments they they said they didn't feel untrue but it was the public face of the FARC now the paramilitaries do not invite the press around to document the things that they're doing and so this was a whole side of the conflict that certainly could not be ignored but the the stakes were were much higher Mm. because going into a place where you would you would not particularly be welcome and the people who were killing other people would not necessarily be in uniform uh, and they were not negotiating for peace so they they didn't necessarily need to be nice to foreigners or the press no. but you know after that that initial six months and and sort of um, or however many months it was in at that stage um, I felt a bit more confident about about pushing forward and also this was a conflict where journalists, particularly foreign journalists, were not a target. Again, something that became totally different later on in my photographic journey and other conflicts. I don't think I would ever have got to where I got as a photographer and and having work from big publications on other conflicts if I hadn't have had that opportunity in Colombia and that really just comes down to thankfully getting up and going and getting started on that whilst that situation existed. I think still in Colombia you know there is still a lot more access but you know maybe nothing like it was back then. How did you then manage to get around all the different groups and the factions because I think there's one story where you were you start off in a field I think it may, may you may have been with the FARC and the government were shooting at you and I think they cleared off and left you 
and you were the one being shot at. Yes, so that was um, shortly after the government started to retake the, the zone, the demilitarised zone. Yeah. So the FARC were coming out and setting up uh, little sort of roadblocks and creating a bit of a human shield, holding drivers and their vehicles in the road uh, to entice the military to come out and engage in a skirmish. And it was just sort of wearing the military down and also scaring the locals mm. because, you know, you only have to kill a couple of people and burn one car and no one wants to drive down that road for, for a few days and you can, you can upset the economy and, and all sorts of things in the region. I was with two other photographers that day. We came across a roadblock and the FARC were there and there, there were a few faces that I, that I recognised from previous things. And I, we asked if it was okay to work because it's always a good idea to ask people with guns if it's okay, if you can Absolutely. make pictures before you just start. And they told us to get on and do our job. Uh, and then gradually they were sort of sliding off the road into a ditch. There was a, there was some gunfire, there were rams cracking overhead and government troops were wading across a river because the rebels had blown up the bridge, so there was no there was no road movement. The counterinsurgency troops were wading across the river, and as they got within effective range, sensibly, the FARC started to leg it into the bushes. Yeah. Now, all of the civilians had gone across to the other side of the road, and two of my photographer friends had gone with them. Because I was kind of documenting things with the FARC, I stayed with them to photograph them, and then they, they sort of bugged out. So by the time the government troops arrived, I was very close to being the only person left in the position that the FARC had been holding. As it, as it happened, when the rain started sort of clipping the grass and the tarmac in front of me, I managed to sprint across the road and get into a ditch over there. Yeah. But it was, it was actually the first time I'd ever ex be, had any experience of being in a firefight. Yeah. It was still combat light compared to situations that one could be in but it was very real and you notice in the pictures of the locals that none of them are treating it like combat light and a joke for them it's deadly serious that the fact that they cannot move from one village to another with their children without being caught up in a situation like this back with jason p howe in a moment for the next three months we're proud to partner for the first time a photographic event and that's an outdoor exhibition in the south of england called photo swindon featuring three international photographers, Martin Parr, Jason Florio, and Sana de Vilde. Now, don't worry if you're not based in the UK, and there's a lot of this audience that aren't, because we'll be linking through today's show notes to their works and the event. But if you are in the UK and in travel distance of the event, this exhibition, curated by photographer Jennifer Berry, features a collection of works with a shared title, In Sync, Natures of Togetherness which deals with a, a world that's coming together now after 15 months of being isolated. It's about how togetherness has always been here, even though we've been locked down. Right, back to Jason P. Howe, Columbia Between the Lines. The saying that the journalist Jason Burke introduced me to, the, the closer you get, the less you know, which is a reference to being so embedded in a war you can't sometimes see the bigger picture. He, he suggested that your closeness is exactly why you've been so successful in telling stories. But it, it's a closeness that, in, in terms of you, Jason, is really quite literal in that the years you spent in Colombia found you in a relationship with a woman called Marilyn, who had a surprising secret. Yes, um... When I first decided that I wanted to go and photograph the paramilitaries, I realised that the most sensible thing to do would be to do it as far away from the FARC that I'd been photographing as possible, because a lot of people change sides. Uh, there's a lot of situations where you don't really know who you're dealing with. Yeah. Um, and so sensibly, I needed to, to, to create some distance. So I travelled down to the south of Colombia by bus. I mean, all of this, all of this project was done on a very tiny budget. I, in fact, had a job stacking shelves at Tesco's in between trips to Colombia. So I would earn, however, you know, a few pounds an hour Goodness. on the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift, putting cans of beans and bottles of Coke on the, on the shelves. And when I'd saved enough for another air ticket yeah. and some more film, I would head back and carry on. With the project. It sounds unreal, but this is exactly how it was happening, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, I mean, it made me, it meant that when I was there, I needed to really try and make the most of the time that I had there. And uh, I would stay in places that cost 
to to five dollars a night and i would hitchhike in the back of pickup trucks and i would travel yeah. on buses yeah. there was no hiring a driver and a four by four that was something at that stage which was just out of my my range budget range so and i found that this worked really well because you you had to integrate with the locals and you you would perhaps be in a situation where there was a conversation going on as to who controlled the next bit of road or who controlled the next village. And uh, you could pick up a lot there. And by the time you arrived, you'd often kind of made friends with some people on the bus or the person that you, whose vehicle you were hitchhiking in. So on one particular bus journey, on my first trip down to the paramilitary zone, I met a young woman and we, we ended up on the bus sharing uh, a couple of seats and got into conversation and I explained what I was doing, that I was working on this project about the conflict and that I had been photographing the FARC and now I was off to photograph the paramilitaries. Mm -hmm. Always trying to be very honest and clear with everyone because one lie to the wrong person and you get caught out and that's that's the end of you. You know, in this case, we're not talking about your professional reputation. We're talking about life getting shot in the head. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really good way to teach you how to be very, very honest about things. So I was always very open about that. Yes, I am trying to tell this story from as many different angles and perspectives as possible. Now I would like to meet up with the paramilitaries if possible and see if I can get access. So this young woman told me that her father ran a roadside bar shop uh, with a pool table and that the paramilitaries were regular visitors to that place and that they had a spare room and that I was welcome to stay and she would see about pointing me in the right direction. So that's how that initial meeting happened. So she became a, a very important figure, uh, Marilyn, if, if you will, in terms of on-the-ground knowledge, but, uh, but that developed, didn't it? Well, she, she pointed me in the right direction on certain occasions. To be honest, uh, the attraction to her was more of a physical attraction. Yeah. So she sort of played two roles, really, in the, in the future of, of that um, bit of the story. But then you find out that she's uh, an assassin for hire, which certainly I would imagine didn't come as very welcome news. Yes, I, mean, I have to say it didn't come as the huge shock that most normal people in normal situations would think that it would. So if you spend a fair bit of time in a war zone, almost everyone that you come into contact with is on one side or the other or involved in some way. Yeah. So if you spend a lot of time in a fart camp, you're with young men and women who are risking their lives to fight for something that they believe in. If you spend some time with the military, young men and women doing the same. Uh, if you are out in the coca fields, there's young men and women picking coca, processing coca paste, selling something that goes on to you know other countries and that fuels and funds the the whole conflict. So to meet someone who who lives in a paramilitary area and then to discover that they're involved with the paramilitaries, yeah. that initially was not a big shock. The fact that we had at that point become romantically involved, and this is only very briefly, we're talking, you know, uh, a sort of a little affair of a couple of weeks. And then I, then I went away traveling and working, came back and stayed with the family again. And then, then at this point, she really confessed that she was no longer really just working for the paramilitary. She was almost an assassin for hire. Yeah. So, and her example was that someone would perhaps come and say that their husband or boyfriend was having an affair with another woman and they would pay Marilyn to go and kill that person. Oh, right. Now, that did shock me yeah. because that I could see no justification for. I, I can understand the perspective of most people that you meet in a conflict zone because, I mean, the worst thing we can ever do is look at any situation from one narrow perspective. We have to look at, at all the sides. And so I saw her, for example, you know, as a, as a bit of a victim of circumstance, as someone who's growing up in a very violent society where people are being killed every day and given the opportunity to be violent and being encouraged to be violent by one of these paramilitary groups recruited and then that just meant that she really kind of completely lost her, yeah. her moral compass and when i questioned her as to what why what she was doing what are you doing with the money that you're getting from these killings are you trying to create a new life for you and your daughter and uh, and she she wasn't and she and she didn't she she talked about sometimes feeling sad about the, the people that she killed she, she eventually killed at least 25 people i know of mm. 
And she talked about the first person that she killed begging for their life and saying that they had a child and her commander saying, you kill him or I kill you. Mm. And then after she'd done that, she went home and she felt ill. She didn't want to be around her family. But her commander said, once you've killed once, you can kill again. Mm. And she found it easier and easier until she could kill people just for money, not for any cause. Now, I know your your physical relationship may not have lasted that long, as you say, but... um your relationship with the family and, and, and writing to Marilyn, well, that, that continued even when you were in other countries. But it's a story that doesn't end very well. There's a very poignant picture at the, the back of the book with Marilyn's daughter standing by her mother's grave. What happened? She was actually um, killed in 2004. And the account that I was told of that killing is that she was Stone's death. Yeah. Uh, so she was accused of being an informer, and in Colombia, the slang for an informer is sapo, as yeah. in toad, and the way you kill a toad is you crush it with rocks. So she was killed in a ritualistic manner yeah. as a warning to other people not to be an informer. You know, that was a very sad thing to discover, but much sad, well, my sadness was much more really for her daughter. Like this, this woman had chosen a course of action one that she could have seen other people in her community and in her society and in her country following, and the end result of it is almost exactly the same. Yeah. You get killed. Uh, and I understand that she was, to a certain extent, trapped in, in, in this um, situation, but her daughter was in no way responsible for any of this. And the only bright part is that her daughter in, in that image, I believe, is around about eight or nine, if I remember correctly. Yeah, she is, yeah. When she uh, reached the age of 18, she got in touch with me and she wanted to find out more about what had happened to her mom and, and, and our relationship and so on. And she's now 20, she's studying to be a social worker and she has managed to not fall into the same trap as her mother. She didn't go and try and seek revenge for her mother's killing. And, uh, you know, she's kind of an inspirational story in a way as someone who can break out of a, of a cycle of violence still struggling i mean colombia is still a crazy violent dangerous society for a lot of people but um at least she's you know she's trying to make something of, of her life jason you you were building this uh, this body of work a portfolio eventually a book I, I'm intrigued as to why you left when that moment came where you thought, hmm, I, I've, I've got the story that I can tell right now. Yes, I think that, I mean, lots of pictures have been, had been made of the conflict in Colombia, uh, just general sort of news images, for example. And when I was trying to, to work out what my book or my project would look like, I was struggling in some ways to find a way to, to connect all the images. And Marilyn's story actually became the thread so like you like you said the text in there is is really a journal these were emails that i read, read sent back to my friends and family as things occurred during the the years i was down there and a lot of it is returning to visit marilyn and so on so her death it felt like an end to my journey an end to that story when i look back on the work i look back on the book which was now published 12 years ago mm -hmm. i can certainly imagine that if I'd have done one more trip or two more trips or spent a bit longer on it, how I could have expanded on that story and, and, and uh, improved. But it was my, my first go. And, um, you know, and things have their time and their place, don't they? Well, yes, yes, they do. And it, it's interesting, I think, Jason, that you still feel, though, that, that this work, um, despite it being the, the first work and the, and the learning ground, if, if you like, if you will, um, even though the, the pictures within your work um, certainly look like, um, to me, the mature observations of a photographer that entirely knew what he was doing. You say this is the work that, of all the places you've been to, that you're most proud of. Yes. Uh, I think the main reason for that is that it wasn't being shot for anyone other than myself. Yeah, uh, I could set the, the pace. I could choose to spend as much or as little time on things. So getting access to the paramilitaries was another three-week wait. Yeah. 
uh, the pictures of the day when the bus bomb exploded and killed the soldiers in the road next to me. There were other photographers there until 30 minutes prior to that, but they were on deadline and they had to leave to file images. So they all went away to file pictures of an intact bus with some soldiers standing around it. And 30 minutes later, there was carnage. Yeah. And as there so often is in these conflicts, no one, in this case, I was there, but generally no one around to record the, the reality of what was happening. And, and most of these things, it's time, time invested that makes much stronger work. Mm. And, uh, and I got to shoot it how I wanted. I wanted to shoot it in black and white, and I wanted to shoot it on manual rangefinder camera. It's the only real project that I've ever shot in black and white, and the only one that I ever shot that way. And I often wonder what would have happened if, when I'd gone on to other conflicts, I had continued to shoot that way. I think probably I would have a much stronger body of work, and I would have much better images. Mm. But I kind of got seduced away by being given assignments and needing to produce images quickly for for the media. Yeah. And, and I didn't have a strong enough foundation in storytelling and image making to survive that transition. So the next few conflicts, although, you know, I have some work which I'm fairly happy with it's nothing like the quality in my opinion of the of my columbia images it's extraordinary work um can we talk just generally really about about the feeling of of doing what you do i've read interviews where photographers who follow difficult stories where where, where there is danger either in conflict war, war or other where where the ultimate sacrifice may well be their life that they say they have a respect for the worst that can happen, but they don't really fear death. And there was a really interesting uh, part in the film, um, which we'll talk about more, um, where you, you mentioned being brought up as a Jehovah's and a Jehovah's Witness family, where you believe this sort of odd kind of game changer in, in the way you were able to act as a, as a photographer of conflict. Yes, it was an upbringing that it can at times be very difficult to find the positives in because it's a tough life. Yeah. You know, it's very, very strict, lots of rules and regulations, and you're generally taught what to think, not how to think. And in some ways, in, on certain levels, it didn't equip me at all well for life outside of that religion once I managed to escape from that controlling environment. And in other ways, it did. So, you know, one of the things that that religion does is goes around knocking on doors and preaching to people. And I, I was forced to do that from my childhood mm. upwards. And it meant that I got very used to talking to every type of person there is because you never know who's going to open that door and you have to be able to project a level of confidence and to, to talk to them, which served me well when I moved on to working in a camera shop and being a salesman. I was you know, very happy talking to people yeah. and, and thankful to be talking about a subject that I did love and did care about and that I was, I'd liked being valued as sort of an expert in it. It was a nice, nice transition. But also you spend all of your childhood and, you know, growing up is difficult enough as it is. You grow up being perhaps the only person that is of that religious group in your entire school. So from from five to fifteen or whatever, you are you you're an outsider. Yeah. You're very different from everyone else around, and so you're going to get bullied for that. You're going to get picked on for that. There's going to be a lot of uh, situations that are outside of your control, and and also you know, your whole life is being controlled by that religion. So you, you feel unable to control things in your life. Mm. And I think maybe that breaks some people and maybe other people learn to just be calm and get through it. Mm. And so what I found in later life that in situations that were really, really intense and I was, I, there was no way I could control the outcome, I was able to stay quite calm. So, you know, if you imagine preparing to run across a piece of open ground with a group of combatants to attack an objective. And inside there are some people who are going to try and kill all of you. Mm. And you're the only one without a gun. That is, that's a pretty crazy situation. And for you to, for a person to be able to be calm and make decisions and, and be able to concentrate on making images. We're not talking about literally just staying alive. No. You've got to stay alive and you've got to make images. And so, you know, maybe I'm giving that upbringing more credit for that kind of thing than it's due. But, uh, you know, that's trying to find something positive. But certainly, you know, unlike certain religions, which which teach that when you, when you die, you're going to be going to hell or heaven and judged and all this kind of thing, in that religion, death is the end. So for that, for me, that's never been something to, to fear. If you get to die doing something that you love and enjoying every last moment, well, 
I can't I can't think of anything better to be honest. And and, and your brother actually went into the the British Army, didn't he? With with with, uh, right. with I suppose similar a similar outlook on life. I imagine so. It's not something that I've particularly discussed with him, but one thing that you you see when we, I've spent a lot of time now around soldiers and the private soldier you see lots and lots of similarities yeah and their level of education the part of society that they come from what their uh, prospects would be if they weren't in the army and then if you look at the officers you see an, another strata and then if you look at conflict journalists and conflict photographers you start to see a huge number of similarities like most most of these people are either searching for something or running away from something yeah uh, you know there's a, there's a lot of of uh, damaged people who are attracted to pushing themselves into extreme situations yeah uh, and what for what exact reason we don't know we don't know whether we're trying to punish ourselves for something whether we're trying to atone for something uh, whether we're just seeing how we can handle those situations or using the skills that we've learned previously in our lives to survive difficult situations to hopefully produce work that has a value and can educate other people. You know, one thing I identify um, in the book especially and in the film and on your website and in the other work that I've seen as I've been um, trawling around the internet finding your name associated with pictures... Um, is that uh, there's an awful lot of um, at-play pictures, that life isn't all dark, that there is romance, there are people diving into the sea. And, and that seems to be something that, that, that flows through your work. Well, I think, you know, a lot of photographers sometimes have a problem with admitting that they have enjoyed themselves whilst <laughs> documenting or covering a conflict. Yeah. But war is not all death and destruction if it was most soldiers wouldn't sign up to go if that's all it was because you notice that when that starts happening that is kind of their least favorite part of it as well mm. there is a lot of adventure and there's a lot of fun and there's a lot of amazing relationships built and a lot of amazing experiences because intense situations kind of promote and create that kind of thing the the one thing that i have had a slight problem with occasionally in conflict zones is when people forget that that's where they are when they're documenting something very uh, grave, very heavy, you know, very serious. Yeah. Um, and I and I've reacted badly to it in the past. I now, with a, quite a number of years on from those situations, can understand that most of us in those places were, you know, you kind of end up often kind of half mad from from the experiences that you're going through and to be sort of pointing fingers at, at people for the way that they behaved is is not not useful but trying to to show respect for the people whose lives we're documenting they have no choice they are stuck there i think that is really important and and i don't know whether if the last sort of 20 years or so were to repeat themselves, whether I would be able to make the, the same images. Because certainly by the end of my 10 years of conflict photography, I was a lot less comfortable pointing cameras at people in extreme situations than I was at the start of it. And that is perhaps surprising. I was kind of surprised to discover that, that instead of it becoming something I was, had become normalised, I really didn't want to be doing it anymore. My thanks to Jason P. Howe, who will return Monday for part two when we move on to the Middle East and talk more of the issues which feature in a film made about his work as a photojournalist, A Good Day to Die, Hoka Hay. And that's it for today. Keep sending your questions, your feedback and photo stories to studio at photographydaily.show. That's studio at photographydaily.show so that I can feature you in the mailbag edition, which is, of course, the Friday Photo Walk. On that note, remember you can also send in pictures from your own photo walks to appear in the episode's show page online with links to your website and Instagram if you choose. If you haven't yet, join our private Facebook group and follow us on Instagram. Links to all this and our guests and our wonderful supporters on Patreon will be on the Photography Daily Show page today, linked to in your podcast player app as always. Friday then, the Photo Walk edition, photo meditation, out for a walk with our thoughts about making pictures and inspirational quotes from former guests. Music on the show today from the incredible Artlist.io. And I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.